Nicholas Dawsbury, Peter Boos and Innovating Diagnosis of Urine, Urinary Diseases. Um, John um, has only been with us a short time uh, here at Teesside. He, uh, his career started at the University of York where he uh, obtained a first at class degree in biology. He then went on to study a PhD at the University of Cambridge in Neuroscience. Uh, subsequently, he has held a number of research fellowships, including the Wellcome Trust VRP Research Fellow at the University of Oxford uh, and Age UK Research Fellow at the University of Surrey. Uh, John went on to join the University of Portsmouth uh, before joining Teesside, and uh, in 2021 he became a Professor of Translational Healthcare here at the National Horizon Centre at, at Teesside University. Uh, John's research aims to improve the lives of patients living with chronic conditions, in particular ur urinary tract diseases. Uh, one of his most important pieces of work is the development of smart wearables, uh, which enable individuals with conditions such as kidney failure and cardiovascular disease, uh, and also their caregivers, to monitor treatment levels in real time. And it uh, obviates the need for uh, hospital uh, attendance and also the uh, need for invasive tests. As well as a dedicated researcher, uh, John has a passion for educating tomorrow scientists and healthcare pr practitioners and is involved in significant amounts of outreach work at the National Horizon Centre, including the mentoring of young people. So it's a real pleasure for me to introduce John's lecture uh, and uh, I'll hand over to you now. Thanks, John. Thank you very much, Steve. Um, thank you, everybody. Thank you very much to the technical team that is supporting today's session. So, Rick and there are two Pauls. Thank you very much to Francesca and to Rachel for organising today's session. And thank you to you for taking time out of your day to, to be here. That's much appreciated. Is it too loud at the back? I can hear my own voice booming. <laughs> I'd hate for you to fall asleep. Um, so, Professor Cummings has introduced me, which is really kind. Um, the illustrations in today's lecture are made by somebody that I collaborate with on one of our educational pro projects, a lady called Suchi, who's based um, a long way away and is a fantastic illustrator. And there's her website details. So I'd like to give just a brief description of how I got here, and I don't mean the A66. Um, so I'd like to describe that research journey, and it addresses one of the comments I've had from um, Professor Cormac Ryan about how you, know, how you go from neuroscience to urology and I hope Cormac to, to be able to answer that question. If I, if I don't then please don't ask a difficult question at the end. Um, so the PhD as Professor Cummings was explaining was at the University of Cambridge, it was neuroscience but it wasn't central neuroscience, it was peripheral neuroscience and I was interested in the communication between nerve and muscle um, in the periphery and how temperature affects that. And we're particularly interested in adaptations in cold-blooded animals which live either in very cold environments or in changeable environments. So we have here on the left-hand side an isopod. An isopod is a type of woodlouse. And these large beasties live in minus two waters around Antarctica. And they serve the same role as a crab in the UK. So they are scavengers and they wander around. But they do that at minus two. Our crabs don't work at minus two, they, they stop working, they don't freeze, but they, they stop working. And we're trying to understand how adaptations in this animal allow it to work at that temperature. But we also wanted to understand why at plus two degrees this animal stops working. So what are the adaptations that allow it to work at minus two but mean that it can only ever work at that temperature. So by comparing the physiology of that animal to something related to it, um, I, I went about characterising those changes that have occurred over evolution and actually providing, providing the foundation to study neuroscience and physiology in other animals later on in my career. I spent most of my time in a giant walk-in fridge or freezer for six months of the year dressed like this gentleman here. That's not me, but I could easily have looked like that. So that was my, my PhD. Um, after my PhD, with a passion for science communication, I did a role at the Royal Institution of Great Britain where I project managed and co-wrote scripts for the Christmas lectures in 2004. This is Professor Lloyd Peck, a friend, a fantastic mentor with a starfish from Antarctica. And um, you might recognise this gentleman, I actually don't know his gender, in the middle. This is Jabba the Hutt. Jabba the Hutt was made by a chap called John Coppinger and I worked with him on the Christmas lectures in 2004 to make some of the props and set design 
for the lecture. It was a fantastic experience to work with somebody who's as experienced as that. So having done a role in science communication, I went back into academia, first the University of Oxford, then to the University of, University of Nevada in Reno, and then back to Oxford. So this is a five-year span summarised in a single slide, which seems very wrong. Uh, but in these roles, I was studying, again, that nerve-muscle interaction. And where previously I'd looked at skeletal muscle, the muscle that you think of when you think of muscle, the type of muscle that meat-eaters eat, um, in this case, I was looking at smooth muscle, muscle that makes up your internal organs. And so the vas deferens in the male, the urinary bladder, which is the subject for a lot of today's talk, and the small intestine. And, and these are the the nerve terminals, they innovate or, or communicate with muscle within our smooth muscle organs. So that was five years of my life and very enjoyable it was. Um, then I moved to the University of um, Surrey where I was focusing on bladder disease. I'd had a taste for bladder physiology and pathophysiology at the University of Oxford where I worked with Alison Brading and a chap called Professor N. Meng. And uh, the, the fact that there was so much unmet need to really describe the physiology and, and, and disease processes in the bladder was really a calling for me. So I went to the University of Surrey to apply my neuroscience skills, my experience of studying physiology and pharmacology, um, to work with uh, a, another amazing mentor, and Prof Professor Chris Fry. So, in this role, I was interested in changes that accompany the disease progression from health to disease, what changes occur during this time frame, and in doing so, to, uh, to, to elucidate new targets for treatments. In 2010, I was very successful in getting an AGK and Rose Trees Trust uh, Research Fellowship, which I began at Surrey and then took to Portsmouth with me in 2012. In my role at the University of Surrey, we work very closely with companies developing new treatments. So Pfizer, Takeda, Boston Scientific, to name a few. And we were involved in a large EUFP7 grant that we ran from the University of Surrey. I got to work with lots of people outside of academia, and that was eye-opening, and it really gave me an appetite for producing real-world benefit by working with industry. Something which, unfortunately, still gets a, a bad name in academia, but... I have no idea why. It's the only way to achieve real-world benefit is to work with experts in this field. So from Surrey, I joined Portsmouth in 2012. And as a group leader for the first time, I began a journey to identify new, improved methods to diagnose the basis of somebody's symptoms. As I'll go on to explain, there's a huge unmet need here. Many people have urinary symptoms but the basis of those symptoms is largely unknown. And it's very difficult to determine the cause of their symptoms with the methods that we have currently available. So I began a journey to do that. My journey is based around identifying biomarkers, sometimes chemicals within urine, sometimes chemicals within blood, sometimes other markers of disease or disease progression. And uh, I was lucky enough to get a lot of funding for that research while at Portsmouth and my expertise in biomarker discovery and development of those discoveries led to collaborations with people outside of urology, um, such as in the School of Health, Exercise, Sports Sciences at the University of Portsmouth, where we look at adverse response of an individual to their environment. So high temperature, low temperature, hypoxia, etc. And that's in a number of different projects that I've brought with me or have got funding since I've been at Teesside are around that biomarker work, broader than just urology. It won't be the focus of today's session where I focused entirely on urology. So this brings me to my move to Teesside where we have state-of-the-art facilities allowing me to ask the questions that I want to ask but answer them in much greater detail than previously was the case, unlocking so much potential for the research that I'm doing. Secondly, and not unrelatedly, we have unrivaled expertise in those techniques. So it's not a case of me having to reinvent myself, as I think I've had to demonstrate I've done previously in my career. I can now work with experts, many of whom are in this room, 
who can help me to realise the potential of the research. And then finally, and as significant as the other points, are the collaborative partnerships. So Teesside University works very closely with its partners in the area. It's a university for the community. And in particular, we work very closely with healthcare providers and we work very closely with industry. And that allows us to realise the impact of our research. That's so important to me and is a significant reason for coming to Teesside. I'll talk about partnerships at the end if there's time. And since I've been at Teesside, I've uh, been awarded, uh, I think it's six funding awards, whether it's a, a, a contract research or a, a traditional research grant, uh, funding from Rose Trees Trust, NHSX, DSTL for the broader biomarker research work, and a recent grant from Northern Accelerator. And uh, this is just a testament to the environment that we're in, which is so rich for the translational research that I do. So fantastic to be here. I'm very lucky that that's the case. Um, so I've tried to tell a story, referring to Cormac. You can switch off in a minute, Cormac. But i tried to tell a story about how I've really gone from basic research, learning techniques, and then applying those to physiology, then to disease, and then applying those to the real world through innovation, developing diagnostics, that sort of thing. Um, so that's the, the trajectory there. But you could look at it a different way. You could say that actually all I've done is I've gone progressively further south. I didn't want to learn French, and so I've headed back north again. <laughs> so that's a, another way of telling that story. I don't, I'll let you decide which is true. Okay, so that's the reason I'm here, and I would like to use my professorial lecture as a platform to raise awareness about the impact of urological symptoms, about some of the innovations that myself and colleagues are working towards to address this unmet need. Um, some of what I'm going to say is uncomfortable, um, and it's n these, these are topics that are rarely discussed, so uh, apologies if it makes anybody slightly uncomfortable. There are two anatomical images um, which I'll warn you about in advance. So I'd like to start off with a very sobering statistic from a study by uh, Shidech et al. from last year, uh, sorry, from two years ago, uh, that 70% of adults aged over 40 experience chronic urinary symptoms. So this isn't uh, an acute urinary tract infection, this is a chronic uh, series of urinary symptoms. This is a large study uh, in individuals aged between 40 and 90, and we see the same from any other large, high-quality study. This was done in Poland, but there are many other studies that show the same. This is one of the best quality studies of its nature. And when we say urinary symptoms, we're talking about a whole broad range of symptoms. So they include what we call story symptoms, symptoms that occur as our bladder fills with urine. So they are increased frequency avoiding, waking during the night to avoid, urgency, which is this sensation that you desperately need to pee and you would dash to the bathroom, and then incontinence. And there are voiding symptoms. So as we pass urine, there are a whole host of different symptoms, many of which I won't read out, but individuals will experience painful urination, they may have a feeling of incomplete bladder emptying, etc. And then there are related symptoms, such as blood in the urine, abdominal pain, and then loin pain, so pain at the, the sides here. So a whole host of different symptoms. Now I'm going to go on to make the point that these symptoms are really impactful for the individual, for their carer and for the healthcare system. I'm going to focus on one particular symptom to illustrate that point before then coming back out and dealing with symptoms more broadly. So focusing on incontinence. So urinary symptoms significantly impact patients, carers and society and focusing on incontinence only. There are many studies that show the impact of incontinence on individuals and some of those studies look at both sexes. Many of them look at just one sex. And the study that I'm going to cite focuses just on women, but incontinence in men is just as big a deal, and I could have focused on, on men. But I wanted to focus on women. And a uh, lovely illustration here from, from Suchi that captures these elements. So women with incontinence are two to three times more likely to suffer from mental illness. And the impact of incontinence includes the emotional impact on an individual, the fear of having incontinence in public, becoming socially withdrawn because of that. Note to self, don't stand on the metal thing. 
A second impact is that on relationships, so the fear of intimacy, the fear that you smell of urine. The third is stopping exercise for fear of incontinence. The impact on employment, where you feel stigmatised, you then become withdrawn from work, you have days off sick, it can affect your employment history and then confidence going for jobs. And then finally, and more self-explanatory, the quality and length of sleep. So incontinence itself is highly impactful. Urinary symptoms have broader impacts and incontinence is an example of that. So incontinence causes further diseases and is linked with mortality, something which is surprising at first glance. So incontinence causes falls and associated fractures as people dash to the bathroom. It's related to urinary tract infections, particularly in individuals who are containing urine in a pad or pants and who have mobility issues or dementia and they forget that they need to change their underwear. It causes a condition called incontinence-associated dermatitis, which is a, a, a very nasty condition where the skin that's been exposed to urine breaks down. Its barrier function breaks down and it causes significant damage. And there are many, many other uh, diseases and, uh, and serious impacts of incontinence. It, in many, causes the requirement of care. So that can be sending somebody who's suffering from incontinence um, in, into residential or into um, institutional care simply because their needs can't otherwise be supported. And then finally, there are huge direct and indirect costs. Very large numbers for individuals and for the healthcare system. So this is just a single symptom in continents. But moving more broadly again to broader urinary symptoms, we know that patients delay seeking help. So as few as 20% of individuals seek help, and this is a highly cited study. And the barriers to, to individuals seeking help include a lack of knowledge about the cause of their symptoms, about the availability of help, and this idea that actually any urinary symptoms are part of healthy ageing, just like the hair turning grey. Misconceptions, a little bit of an overlap with that previous definition. Not wanting to bother a healthcare practitioner who has quote unquote more important things to deal with than me. An embarrassment of suffering from symptoms. So together a number of symptoms which or a number of reasons why people don't seek the help when they start to develop symptoms. So as a group lead many years ago I wanted to try to address some of the things that I've talked about so far. To do that, of course, as an academic, you can turn in many different directions. But what I wanted to do was to go to all those people who were affected and ask them about what sort of interventions might work best for them. So I went to patients and their carers, healthcare practitioners, healthcare providers, um, and asked them about what innovations might improve their own interaction with urinary symptoms. And we identified challenges. So the barriers to seeking, seeking help that I've described, the timing of when patients present with symptoms. Often patients will go to a GP when they've had symptoms for many years. A lack of education in areas of clinical practice about how to manage a patient with urinary symptoms or complex needs. Um, the inability to differentiate a cause of a patient's symptoms the limitations of current diagnostic methods, and then finally the limitations of current therapeutics. So in the next 20 minutes, I differentiate two groups, focusing first on these first three, which myself and colleagues have addressed with a number of educational interventions. So the first two were to patients and to carers, where we provide information signposting and aim to encourage conversations around urinary symptoms to, to try to break the taboos that occur. So I've been working with TENA since 2019 about um, improving the communication uh, around the causes of urinary symptoms for their web pages throughout the world. And so there's um, slightly more than 30 articles that I've, I've written on their web pages now in lay English, intended to be entirely accessible irrespective of your background, um, and really trying to uh, bust some of the myths around urinary symptoms. And of course, Tenor 
get huge amounts of web traffic. So hopefully we're engaging individuals in this. And then uh, this is a project with Suchi and, uh, and Wessex HSN and Hampshire County Council. So we produced a leaflet to try to, again, bust some of the myths around urinary symptoms. And this has been sent to a small number of houses at the moment um, in Hampshire, and we're seeking some funding to um, get it sent nationally to, to houses. So each of these two projects aims to challenge taboos, encourages patients to seek help, and importantly directs individuals to the health and support services that are available, but many people are not aware of. The second two educational projects are focused on healthcare providers, upskilling practitioners in the management of continents. So the first is a project I'm very proud to have been part of. It was commissioned by Health Education England in 2019, and we put together an e-learning package which is mandatory um, continuous professional development for all NHS England staff. So this was launched in 2020, and at the time of standing here, I think, uh, it's, I think it's over 10,000 clinicians, it may be just below, it's certainly a large number, who have undertaken this training um, to try to raise awareness about how to deal with continence care in a frail adult. A second project will be launched on the 7th of March, run from Teesside University, and many thanks to Anne Thanaraj and her team for helping me to develop that package and to the university for supporting it. And this is a, um, a CPD, a, an e-learning package for care home staff where there's a significant unmet need. There's a high turnover in care homes, there's very little money, uh, very little time, so what we need to do is to have a way to train individuals, often who have individuals who have not had a background in nursing or in medical education, to try to make them um, uh, better aware of how they can help a, a patient, an individual with urinary symptoms. This is a project that's funded by Rose Trees Trust, but there has been significant investment by the university to provide the infrastructure to deliver this care home package at scale. So one um, organisation that is going to use this, Hampshire County Council, aims to train 30,000 individuals using this, uh, this e-learning alone. So um, thanks to the university for supporting that. So both of these two e-learning packages aim to show care through the perspective of the patient. They focus on improving quality of life, identifying treatable, potentially reversible conditions and other factors that might cause somebody's symptoms. So for example, in an older adult that has a mobility issue, they might be incontinent because they simply can't get to the toilet in time. And so understanding some of the factors that affect someone's urinary symptoms can be a key to addressing them. And that's one of many examples. Okay, so I've talked about four different educational packages that aim to address these first three challenges that were identified by the people that I and others have consulted. And in the second half of the talk, I'm going to talk about our work around diagnosis of underlying causes of urinary symptoms. Now, this is the first of two anatomical images for which I apologise. Um, I want to explain that our approach is not finding different buckets to put under a dripping tap. Forgive a rather black and white or crude metaphor, but there is and continues to be a huge amount of money and research that goes into providing different buckets to go under the dripping tap. So I went to a conference and people were getting very excited about a particular type of clip. Now that's fantastic if you're an individual with existing incontinence. I personally feel that we need to invest our efforts to try to prevent incontinence from happening in the first place rather than simply investing the huge amount of money that we do on catheters and containment projects, uh, products. And, and that's about 95% of all the budget that goes into urology research is on containment products rather than trying to turn off the tap. Okay? And those approaches are not new. So this is from 1747, this is 1682, and uh, these may seem familiar. They're just ways to contain urine or ways to deal with um, a situation where somebody is incontinent. This is no different to the innovation that was um, hailed as being really exciting at a, at a conference just a few years ago, and yet, you know, it's, it's many hundreds of years old. 
So back to this challenge sheet, these uh, symptoms that are so common. I think one of the issues that faces clinical practice is differentiating the cause of some of these urinary symptoms. So I listed a number of different symptoms, and Suchi has illustrated those beautifully on the right-hand side. And a big focus of my work has been on a particular condition called overactive bladder. It's defined by storage symptoms, and I'll go into more detail on the next slide. And it's very difficult to differentiate overactive bladder from other causes of urinary tract symptoms. So overactive bladder is defined by increased frequency during the day and the night, urgency, that need to dash to the bathroom, and incontinence. It affects at least one in five adults. There is increased prevalence with increasing age. And again, like the causes of many urinary symptoms, it impacts all aspects of a patient's lives and the lives of their carers. Now really drastically, alarmingly, diagnosis of this very common and very impactful condition is not good enough. So the primary way it's diagnosed is with this invasive technique. So I'll talk you through this and I appreciate it's a bit uncomfortable doing so, but a pressure probe is inserted through the urethra into the bladder and a second probe goes into the rectum or in females into the vagina in order to very accurately measure pressures within the bladder. Now what clinicians are looking for is they're looking for contractions of the bladder as it fills with urine. So a quote-unquote healthy bladder should expand to accommodate urine that comes from the kidneys. But and Sorry, nobody's bladder is that big unless they have an issue. Um, <laughs> but what happens in some individuals is as it expands, there are these involuntary contractions. That's a biomarker, a hallmark, and some people believe it's pathological. And so this test is looking for that. It's looking for these contractions, these changes in pressure that occur as the bladder is filled with urine. But the problem is that this technique is not only highly invasive, and I'm pretty sure that picture makes that point, it's actually highly insensitive. So these contractions occur in individuals whether or not they have symptoms. People have looked for 20 years and they see that they don't develop symptoms even if they have these contractions. Likewise, there are people with symptoms who don't have the contractions. Okay, and so here are some citations. If that seems far-fetched, here are some citations that support that. It's expensive. It's done in specialist urology referral centres. And it's not suitable for adults with frailty, so for many older adults with symptoms. I've recently begun to collaborate with a clinician locally, Ms. Uh, Mewash Nadim. And she told me in a meeting last week that actually there's a one and a half year waiting list for this apparatus uh, in, in this particular region and throughout the UK. So for an individual who has this particular condition, overactive bladder, if they don't, if their symptoms don't respond to the first line medication, which are just tablets, there are some other treatment options, but those treatment options are not given until an individual has this particular diagnosis, and that can take a year and a half to do. So there's a problem with the system. And so we wanted to address this. A second issue that I've said verbally but not illustrated is an overlap in symptoms. So this seemingly complicated slide, although not to any omics people, um, it shows a number of different symptoms along the top and then a number of different conditions down the side. Um, and it's not a bad abacus. The idea here is to illustrate an overlap in the symptoms. So overactive bladder defined by the symptoms I described. And we can see an overlap with urinary tract infection, with interstitial cystitis, etc. The circles which are unfilled are symptoms which occur less frequently, that, that can occur in some, whereas the ones that are filled are symptoms that are more hallmark of that particular condition. And it's very simplified. It's much more complicated clinically. So it's very difficult for a clinician to be able to diagnose overactive bladder or indeed many of these other conditions simply and cheaply and in a time-effective way that allows treatment and management of some of these symptoms. So we wanted to improve diagnosis and it's no surprise that the first thing we did was to go to the various different people and groups that are affected by overactive bladder. And when we did that in a, pro sorry, in a project that was funded by Innovate UK and Hefke, um, we heard five themes. The first is that any diagnosis needs to occur in a point-of-care setting. 
so a GP surgery, a pharmacy, a nursing care home, and not in a specialist referral hospital with a long waiting list. Secondly, it needs to be accurate. So it needs to have the means to differentiate the cause of the symptoms from similarly presenting conditions and diseases, going back to that previous slide with the abacus and the overlapping symptoms. Thirdly, it needs to be non-invasive, so it needs to be suitable for all patients, including adults with frailty. It doesn't need to require a specialist centre and a team of people to insert pressure probes into places that we don't want to be inserting pressure probes. There needs to be a rapid outcome, so a single appointment with no need to send a sample away and wait to hear back. And then finally, it needs to be simple to use and interpret, with no specialist training and no equipment required. So with that as our wish list, myself and uh, a fantastic scientist that worked with me for a number of years, first doing a PhD and then as a uh, number of postdocs, Dr. Sepinu Farusmand, began her PhD that was funded for by the University of Portsmouth, looking at components of urine. So she and others looked at the cellular component of urine, but today I'm going to talk just about the, the, the kind of wet component of urine, asking the question as to whether chemicals within urine could be used to differentiate the, um, dif the basis of urinary symptoms. Now, I've got a series of graphs. I'm going to talk you through those. I don't want to dumb down the, the lecture because um, I think given enough description, I think anything is accessible. So we have on this axis here, we have increasing symptom severity. So towards the bottom, we have somebody with no or very mild symptoms and towards the top, severe symptoms. And then on this x-axis, we have the increasing concentration of chemicals that we identify and measure within urine. And you can see in this example that we have increasing concentrations of those chemicals as we have increasing symptom severity. We have a positive correlation. And it's worth noting that in most of our individuals that were recruited for this study, they had mild to moderate symptoms. So they're towards the, the bottom end of the spectrum rather than the top end. So SEPI and others in the lab looked at a whole wide range of different chemicals based on previous work that I'd done to identify changes that occur with disease. And she saw positive correlations for a number of those. So we, we know that individual chemicals increase with disease severity, and we now need to make that into something that's useful for patients and clinicians. So she performed statistical analyses to see whether single biomarkers or combinations of biomarkers could predict whether somebody had early stage overactive bladder or not. Because what we ultimately want to do is to take individuals with urinary symptoms and be able to differentiate those to those that have early stage overactive bladder that we can treat and those individuals that have the same symptoms where the cause is not overactive bladder. Now, I think it's worth explaining what we mean by sensitivity and specificity. These terms have been used a lot with lateral flow tests for the uh, detection of COVID, and there, there aren't very good definitions of these. So we need a test which is sensitive, so that it detects the condition at a very early stage. And if somebody sneezes, we could diagnose them as having a cold, and we might treat that cold. And in terms of the, the life cycle of a cold, sneezing is one of the first symptoms, isn't it? Okay. But the problem is that sneezing is sensitive, but it's not specific. Somebody might sneeze because they have an allergy. They might sneeze because they've had sunlight in their face or they have just been dusting and it's triggered them to sneeze. So it's sensitive, but it's not specific. We can wait until they start to produce green mucus because we know at that point they've got a cold. And that's specific, so you're not going to be producing green mucus from your nose if you don't have a cold. But it's not sensitive enough to, to treat proactively. By that point, the, condition, the person's been suffering with the condition for a number of days. So what we want as scientists working to develop new diagnostic methods is a technique, a device which is sensitive and specific, which detects the condition early and is specific only to that condition. And we do that with a statistical test that we rate on a scale of zero to one. So zero would be it's not very good, and one would be a technique which is sensitive and specific. And to cut a very long story short, we've identified combinations of chemicals within urine which 
are sensitive and specific to early stage overactive bladder. So on our scale of 0 to 1, we're at 0.76 and 0.83. There are tests that you'll have come across that can be represented in using the same numbers, the same type of test. <coughs> so HCG is a chemical within urine produced uh, and it, it peaks in women who are pregnant in the early stage of pregnancy. And pregnancy tests and using HCG has this value of 0.61. So on a scale of zero, not very good, one, excellent, HCG for pregnancy is 0.61. Prostate-specific albumin for the detection of prostate cancer is 0.68. So our methods perform better than similar tests at an early stage of their development. I should add that the modern tests for pregnancy or for prostate cancer use, a bit like ourselves, they use additional chemicals to improve the sensitivity and the specificity. So modern tests have much higher values similar to the values that we have and, and sometimes beyond that. Now when we published this in early 2020, it was picked up by the world's media and that was surprising and, and, and wonderful. So it made the national newspapers of the UK and overseas. It's on the front page of Florida Post, believe it or not. And I was due to go on to the Swedish version of the one show um, until COVID hit and then that was cancelled, um, which is a story to tell grandchildren. Um, so what we're doing now at Teesside in a place that has a rich history of developing innovations to serve its community is we're developing a point of care device. And uh, I have Alex in the audience who's working with me on this. And the idea is that the device is dipped into urine. I don't know why the, the urine has disappeared from that. <laughs> but it's dipped into the urine and uh, through a smartphone app it um, tells you whether or not you have early stage overactive bladder or not and gives you a link to telemedicine so that you can speak to a clinician straight away. It's, you know, that you have something useful to do with the information that you've just been given. With the idea being, again, that we differentiate between individuals who have symptoms into early stage overactive bladder and those individuals who have the same symptoms but a different underlying cause. And in the case of individuals with overactive bladder, we can direct them to appropriate treatment, to symptom monitoring, make sure they're not, it's not getting worse, and any additional support that they may need, whether that's health or social support. And likewise, for those individuals who test negative but have symptoms, that we can then route them towards other diagnostic tests to understand what the basis of their condition may be. Now, I'm mindful of the time. I know we started a little bit late, um, but I'll try not to talk too much longer. I'd like to briefly describe some of the work that we've been developing at Teesside um, to take the expertise around biomarker discovery and development that we have within the group and to, um, to use that information on other projects. So the first, and uh, Professor Cummings referred to this, is um, a number of projects with a company called Leo Medical, based in California, um, and they've developed a wearable device which is non-invasive and measures properties of the blood, including the concentrations of electrolytes, um, chemicals within the blood. And that's particularly useful in patients that have chronic health conditions, such as cardiovascular problems, diabetes, etc., um, where we would want to monitor those chemicals to make sure that an individual stays healthy and that they can self-manage. In an area such as the one we're in currently, where there are individuals in rural communities, it saves trips to the hospital and it aims to relieve some of the burden on an overstretched NHS. Um, I'm working with a group in Nottingham and Liverpool on point-of-care diagnostic devices for individuals with acute kidney injury. This is a very common and impactful condition. It occurs in a number of different clinical settings, emergency care, cardiac surgery, um, individuals with renal issues, and um, it can lead to death in a proportion of individuals. So we want to spot it early, we want to treat early, and we're together developing a point-of-care test to better detect acute kidney injury. And then I continue my work with colleagues at the University of Portsmouth where we're looking at biomarkers, um, in particular in, in heat shock and in a condition called non-freezing cold injury or trench foot. And these are projects that um, we've recently been awarded funding for from DSTL 
um, to further develop here at the University of Teesside. I, I forgot to mention that the work with Leo Medical has been funded by NHSX, uh, for which I'm very grateful. So I'd like to summarise the urology work before making a couple of very brief additional points, if I may. So in terms of urology, I hope to tackle the, the issues that we have and, and, and we'll continue to do so at Teesside through education. And I described working with Tenor and working with Wessex HSN and, and Hampshire County Council to produce a leaflet. And these projects are aimed at patients and carers to provide information and to bust some of those myths that occur. Uh, I did an e-learning project with Health uh, Education England targeting NHS staff and then very soon we will launch a project from Teesside aimed at care home staff to provide some of the education that is needed to better manage patients that have or individuals that have continence um, uh, issues whether that's incontinence or, or other symptoms. And then towards the end I talked about innovation in healthcare and the work that I do and, and we do here at Teesside spans this spectrum of from discovery through development of devices, evaluating devices and then implementing those towards achieving impact. And it's the impact that's the goal of this work. We want to save lives, we want to improve quality of life and we ultimately want to have cost savings for the NHS who are our partners throughout this work. And so I've talked about projects at different stages in that cycle. It's really exciting to be at an institution that um, develops <coughs> projects across that entire range. And of course, all of this is done in consultation with the end users, which in my case are the, the patients, the healthcare practitioners, and then industry colleagues with the expertise of taking our discoveries and helping us to understand the, the best way to get those to the patients and to the clinicians. Um, in the last minute, and I promise you no more than a minute, I'd like to talk about something that's important to me. Steve kindly mentioned um, my passion for mentoring individuals. Um, which, I, which I do on an ad hoc basis and I'm grateful for, for that. Um, historically, I've done something more strategic. So for five years, myself and uh, Dominique, Dominica Bijosh, uh, who is just here, and uh, a couple of other individuals, we, we set up a, a, a meeting, an annual conference for early career individuals that work either in academia, in industry, or as clinicians but in the field of urology, to try and join those dots. There's very little funding for urology research. And what happens, happens in a very nebulous way. So by joining the dots, forming those collaborations, the aim of these meetings was to, to make sure that we had a generation that would work together. It's been very successful at forging those collaborations. It's something that I stopped doing, because when I was at Portsmouth, I took on leadership roles, and that took me away from having the time to do this. But uh, something that we may consider starting again um, from Teesside. And then finally, I can't overstress the importance of working as part of collaborations and networks, building on that previous point. I've worked very closely and been supported by colleagues at Wessex AHSN, and Cheryl Davis has been fantastic at supporting my research in its different guises. And I now am working closely with the AHSN in this region, the NENC. The Durham Tees Valley Research Alliance is a um, an association of three large NHS foundation trusts joining up the clinical demands with the research provision of a number of different universities and it, by engaging with a DT, D, I can never say this Vicky, can I, the DTVRA, or did it, um, we've been able to um, really take some of our discovery research and, and, and find a, a home for it and also address some of the needs of the clinicians that want to innovate but don't have the time to do so. Um, so really very lucky to be part of that research alliance here at Teesside. And then finally with the NHSX project, we're part of the Q community. Q stands for quality, and this is about uh, innovations in practice um, as part of a community working together to improve health and social care across the UK and Ireland. This is a, a big community of scientists and healthcare practitioners, social care practitioners, um, all working to improve the lives of all the different people involved in that system. And it's something which I think will have huge benefits for my research and for, for the university. So it's an odd slide to finish, but I think it's entirely appropriate that if you or anybody else is 
affected by some of the things that I've talked about today. Um, please know there's a lot of help available. People are shy at seeking that help for the reasons that we've discussed, but a lot of help is available. And I'd like to raise the awareness of the fantastic individuals, many of whom work on a voluntary basis to provide help to people with um, chronic urinary conditions. Thank you all for the time that you've given to be here today. And for those people who are watching, thank you for your time and listening to me speak. It's an honour to be at the stage in my career that I'm a professor. Very humbling to be that way. And I see this as you know, yet more um, of a calling, really, to try to support the individuals that are affected by urinary symptoms. So thank you very much. John, thank you for an excellent no. talk. It's, uh, it's a, a privilege to hear what colleagues are doing and, and uh, both the breadth and depth of your, uh, your work is, is uh, tremendous and uh, uh, yeah, awe-inspiring, really. Are there any thank questions you. in the room? Um, there might be immediate questions. Oh, 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 no, no, no. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> uh, thanks very much, John. Uh, I always really enjoy your talks. It's so lucid. In my mind, you kind of generate lots of ideas, which is fantastic. Uh, from my own point of view, obviously, this is going to relate to the brain. Um, so, uh, I was wondering if you kind of thought, or if you've been, if you're aware of research that's looking at the relationship between um, the problems with the bladder and cognitive decline. Obviously, from the neurochemical point of view, we're talking about similar kind of neurotransmitters and yep. you know, acetylcholine. Got obviously automatic features as being early kind of signs of dementia. Yeah. And obviously, the drugs that you use, you can talk to them, the lighting was great, drugs that become allergic drugs that you used for the treatment of these kind yeah. of um, conditions. So, has there been any kind of, I'm kind of thinking about whether this, you know, you, 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 you're focusing on biomarkers, but potentially this could be an early kind of impending sign of the, the onset of dementia. So there's a number of ways to answer that question. It's a really good question. I believe that we're being recorded, so I'll just briefly repeat the question, if I may, um, about the relationship between cognitive decline and urinary symptoms, and particularly the role of the bladder in those urinary symptoms. So we know in individuals that have symptoms that when they have cognitive decline, that can accelerate some of the symptoms that we've described, simply for a number of different practical reasons, in terms of when we void and how we void. Um, we also know that in treating the bladder through, you mentioned, anticholinergic drugs, there's evidence in very uh, highly rated journals that there is a, a relationship between anticholinergic drugs for the bladder and cognitive decline. So we know that treating the bladder can lead to cognitive decline, unfortunately, with some anticholinergic agents. I'm led to believe that's not the case for many of the modern agents that are used now. So if anybody's using anticholinergic agents, don't worry. Now, in terms of that relationship between essentially the autonomic nervous system and the bladder. So the bladder is complicated. It, is, it gets innovation from three different branches of the nervous system. So you have the parasympathetic, the sympathetic, and the somatic nervous system. Somatic nervous system controlling the sphincter muscles and the autonomic nervous system controlling the bladder and the voiding. And we know that changes in that communication can cause problems. It's one of the reasons hypothesized why children will wet the bed because as they grow, things don't grow at the same rate and it takes a little while for things to kind of re-establish themselves. So There's a period where children might bed wet because of uh, kind of miscommunication. So it's certainly plausible that in an individual with cognitive decline that changes in communication can lead to problems in the bladder. Finally, I know I've given a long answer. Fin it's now Friday. Um, <laughs> finally, um, we, 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 know, we know that um, any damage to areas of the brain that control the wiring to the bladder causes issues. So if somebody has damage to the spine or if they have a lesion in parts of the brain, such as the pontine micturition centre, that causes problems. So it's... I try to answer your question fully, and I don't think we really know as to whether cognitive decline is an early biomarker of bladder conditions or whether bladder conditions are a, a sign for um, 
you know, co future cognitive decline. There's such an overlap in the prevalence, and the prevalence is so high. And honestly, we don't have the tools to be able to do that just yet. But I'd like to think that with some of the um, apparatus we've got at the National Horizon Centre, and I'm not meaning to plug that, but that we would hope to be able to address that um, to some degree. Thank you. Really good question. I might give another five minute answer. You may not want to <laughs> ask a question. Excellent lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Beautifully clear, a uh, uh, very eloquent speaker. Lovely. Thank you. You can um, come again. <laughs> uh, my question is about your educational work, which uh, it, 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 you know, looks brilliant and it looks hugely impactful. Um, I guess my question is how are you capturing that impact? Or are you trying to capture that impact? Yeah, so great question. The, so the, unless it wasn't picked up, the question is about whether we can capture the impact of the educational yeah, work that the we're doing. Yeah, the work and the, the right. CPD work, you know, yeah. huge potential for impact. Are, 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 you, are you able to, to capture it? Yes, um, is the short answer. <laughs> <laughs> and now the longer answer. Um, so, for example, with the Care Home Project, I have a, a PhD student whose name is Rachel. And what we are doing is we're asking learners some multiple choice questions before they undertake the e-learning, some multiple choice questions after they've done the e-learning, so we can understand their baseline and then their, um, their level of confidence and competence following the training. So that's one of the ways in which we can see whether there's been an improvement. We will also survey managers and other senior practitioners within the organisation to see whether there's been not only um, increased confidence and competence around staff, but also the health benefits. Um, every organisation that offers care to individuals with conscience issues has individuals that go into hospital because they've had a urinary tract infection and it's become complicated, or that's had a fall because of incontinence. So if these symptoms are better managed, then we should see health benefits. And so we're asking the managers and other senior staff those sorts of questions. Mm -hmm. And we've got similar metrics for the other educational projects, but I'll save those for another day. But we are trying to do that. And I think that's really important because as we, we want to assess these innovations, you know, they, if we do something and it works, we want to be able to then say, look, try this, it works. Not to sell it, but to actually encourage others to do the same. So capturing that information is really important. So, thank thank you. you. Thanks. Do, do we have any questions from colleagues online? We've got two-part question online. Um, first part is what has been your biggest challenge in your research so far and what do you think the next steps are? Where do you think you're going next with it? Okay, so good question, thank you. So in case it didn't pick up, what has been my biggest challenge in my research so far and where are we going with the research? So that I think one of the challenges has been constantly to reinvent ourselves, something that came across in that brief um, biography um, and I think one of the good things about coming to Teesside is there is the expertise so that I no longer have to do that I think which is which is good I, I really enjoy learning new skills and so for example with the uh, PhD of Sepinud Farusman uh, she and I had to learn multivariate statistics we had to learn you know a number of things that we had no idea about before and theoretically we could have gone to an expert and that might have been a lot quicker um, so that sort of reinvention takes time and it means that a project doesn't deliver as quickly as it could. So I think that that's not an efficient way of working and it's nice to work in a place where there is huge amounts of expertise. Um, and in terms of where we're going to next, we've got a number of projects that I couldn't talk about today where we're developing devices for urological purposes and more broad purposes. And what we want to do is to take those into clinic, evaluate those in a clinical setting do evaluations about the health impacts that they can bring in order to make an argument, hopefully, that they can and should be implemented and then to, to, to have them in the hands of patients. It's really nice that we have a project that's at that stage with the wearable, but many of the other projects are not at that stage. So the short answer to the question, which I should have given, is about taking everything on that conveyor belt and just keeping that conveyor belt going and then working with colleagues who work at the discovery side of things, some of whom are in the room, and helping to support them to take their really exciting discoveries and make devices and services that will benefit patients. And again, progress things along that conveyor belt till we reach that patient benefit. Um, 
Yeah, Jim, that, that was really, really fascinating. Thank I you. I love the impactful nature of this. That, that, uh, it's probably a really naive question, but uh, I'm, I'm trying to understand. It, your work's about uh, early diagnosis, yeah. essentially. Fundamental. But I wanted to understand whether, does early diagnosis actually help? Does it mean if you get early diagnosis, you can actually improve uh, life? Uh, because you've got early diagnosis, or do you just know and nothing really can change? Because if 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 that is the case, early diagnosis means that helps uh, and and getting involved early and getting clinical support early improves things. Yeah. Then I can't understand why there's so little funding given the early steps you, you talked about to to actually this is massively life changing if you can if you can do that. So. Thank you. I'd be grateful if you could review all my funding applications from this <laughs> point forward. So the, the question was about whether early diagnosis can improve the lives of individuals through effective treatment. And I didn't have the chance to talk about the fellowship work that I did funded by Age UK and Rose Trees Trust. And what we did is we, we had biopsy tissue of individuals who um, had different se severities of overactive bladder. And we looked at changes that occur. And other people have done similar projects looking at other parts of the bladder with disease progression. And what we find is the bladder totally changes as, the, as it becomes more severe. So it becomes less flexible. Some um, targets for chemicals go. Others that weren't there previously appear. And so the drugs that are given actually don't work very well when somebody has a, a late stage or severe symptom um, sort of portfolio. That's not a phrase, um, when they have severe symptoms. So we have a case to try to treat early, and we know, certainly anecdotally, and there's some evidence that if we treat early, we're much more likely to have an effective outcome. So clinicians are very keen that we can identify a condition early and that they can treat it early, because certainly in their hands, even if it's not always in research papers, early treatment of urinary symptoms is much more effective than later treatment because of the changes that occur as the disease becomes more severe. Could I ask a question? Or, as long as it's not too difficult. So, so um, as bodily fluids go, I think urine <laughs> is, is probably more amenable to the sort of metabolomic analysis yes. than, than others. Um, and obviously your analysis uses the multivariate approach. I suppose, I, I wonder as... Um, the technology improves and certainly the analysis um, using some of the, the, the equipment that we have and the dynamic range of that equipment yes. improves. Do you think that the volume of data and our ability to um, interpret it or analyse it, perhaps using AI for example, yes. uh, is going to enable you to further refine that, that sort of, uh, and I suppose it, you know, if there are markers which are in very low levels but might be yeah. very telling and, and the current dynamic range of the, the equipment it doesn't so I suppose, it, how much more effort do you feel we need to put into that sort of analytical piece and, and link it to the analysis, that potentially uh, artificial intelligence, to interrogate that data effectively? You, I mean, you've very well described what I said very briefly about moving to the NHC and to Teesside University and about how that can unlock the potential of the research. Um, so our ability to identify these chemicals and to do so at scale. Previously, we'd looked at a chemical at a time, and now we can look at many chemicals from a single sample simultaneously and much more cheaply. And then to take that data and with our bioinformatic expertise that we have across the university with huge depth of expertise, yes, we can then mine those data sets really efficiently. And um, we hope very much that we can do that in a way that not only allows us to identify perhaps some unknown causes of these conditions, but to do so in a way that's very efficient. And We've got a number of projects, Vicky and I and, and others in the room, where we've taken our approaches to entirely different conditions, where someone's seen what we've done and said, well, that could work for the thing that I'm working on. Um, could we work together? And so it's, it's definitely a tried and tested approach. We know that it works very well from genomics research and applying it now to proteomic research where previously there wasn't the technology to, to look at a lot of different targets cheaply, um, being able to do that at the NHC will unlock a huge amount of potential. So the answer is yes, um, 
the expertise that we have and the uh, apparatus that we have will allow us to do what we want to do much more efficiently. And uh, it's a fantastic reason for being here. Thank you. OK, I don't think we have any further questions, but I'd just like to thank John again for an outstanding talk. And, and obviously, we wish you well in continuing your research and thank we hope you. the money pours in <laughs> and you can do all those things that you want to do. Thank you. But perhaps we can just uh, show our appreciation once, one more time. For, thank you. For thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you all very much.